Okay, well, that's just, uh, I learned a lot. Uh, at 70, I still can learn something you know, now and then, so I appreciate it. Uh, we heard a presentation, a discussion of shortages and what definitions apply. Uh, we saw some inferred databases, and I think, Ernie, you sort of mentioned the sort of failures in the database, but then we heard the same thing from Scott and the same thing from James, in that uh, as we look at shortages, thinking forward to disasters, what are the real databases that we can look at that would educate and inform us about some of the trends we heard something about? That is, what categories of drugs inject the five eyes versus orals, the category of drugs, cardiovascular versus oncology, et cetera. All of these are important items, I think, for disaster response planners in thinking about how that will influence what they potentially are going to be facing in a reality. You cannot predict that your distribution warehouse is going to be sitting on the fault line and it's going to go down necessarily although I know that a smart distribution manager thinks about that and says, okay, I need a backup. So there are some things that you cannot predict, but I think there are, we've heard some discussion this morning about some things that may be helpful to us in terms of predictive uh, thinking. We've heard some presentations around preventive notions and uh, how that changes. We saw Scott march through the ABCDE plan, ending up with glass bottles and uh, jury-rigged uh, tubing, reminiscent story. of uh, MASH, uh, glass bottles in a cache, you know. Um, but now we have an opportunity for those of you in the audience to ask these gentlemen questions that you may have about their presentation. Uh, I always like to invite political comments, if people have political comments to make. Uh, this is a safe environment for us to talk about what reality looks like. So I'm going to open it now and ask people, and there are mics, I think, on both aisles here. If you have a comment or a question you'd like to direct to our panelists, uh, now's an opportunity uh, to do that. I have one or two, but go ahead. Identify yourself if you would, please, sir. Yeah, they just need to turn the volume up. Try again. Oh, okay. Uh, Matt Winnie with the University of Colorado Center for Bioethics and Humanities. Um, I think the most striking thing I heard was that in something over half of the shortages, we don't actually know why the shortage is in existence. Uh, and I'm just wondering if you could say more about why the FIDESIA requirement does not include some better level of information about what the source or cause of the shortage is. What, what, what's the, why was that not included initially? What, what are the prospects? You asked for a political question. What are the prospects <laughs> for, um, for an amendment that would require better information about the sources and causes of shortages? Sure. Uh, anybody want to field that? I think you've commented a bit on it, but go ahead. Doug has something to say about that, but I think <laughs> my, my guess is Doug would have wanted that in there, uh, but it didn't get in for, for political purposes. Uh, I'm fairly confident that manufacturers don't want to release that information for, for a variety of reasons, uh, but I think that would be one of the single best things we could do to help us is to uh, change that. I don't know what that would take to change. Doug would be a much better expert than I would. Yeah, so a couple of things. That, the, that statistic came from the, the University of Utah database. Yep. Um, we, if you go on our website, there's also a place where you can look. And manufacturers are asked to say why the, the, the shortage occurs. The, the, the numbers are, are roughly that, I believe, for what the manufacturers, uh, uh, you know, whether they give information or not about the reasons. Um, and I think the reason is, 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 is as, as said, there's just sensitivity around some of the things, and, and the companies have you know, prefer not to put, the, put, put some of that on a, on a website. Commonly, they'll talk to us. Some, some manufacturers, like I said, are really good at talking to us about, in, in, in greater detail, about the specific issues that they face. Now, that we're, we're not allowed then to make that public, and I recognize there's a transparency issue there, but from our perspective, then, we're at least able to act on the information. So, 
commonly, we're able to know more. I, I, I share the interest in transparency. I think it would be a good thing. Um, sometimes we don't, and I think that's when, then we're all in a really bad place. So we, we simply don't know what the source of the, man, the, the, the shortage is. We can't respond to it other, other than superficially. And so, um, you know, would, would we favor additional information sharing? Absolutely. How best to accomplish that? You know, whether it's a legislative thing or something that just encourages manufacturers to make additional information available to everybody, um, you know, that's for that's for other folks to to to, to sort out. But better information sharing would be a good thing. If I, if I may on that, and and I'm certainly not the expert here, but they are required to, and if they don't, and you find out about it, then you send them a letter. That's not really much of a penalty. Uh, I mean, granted, you don't want to get too many letters because it looks bad, but that's the punitive if you get a letter. So uh, I would think that if the FDA had the power to enforce that with uh, better penalties, that would help. Just my thought. Yeah, and I would say that it's not limited to the drug supply business. We have the same difficulty with hospital CEOs frequently in getting information about what their capacity and reserve is. This is a problem in a business environment where business sensitive information is uh, held pretty closely by people to protect their market position, whether it's a hospital administrator, whether it's a manufacturer. And this goes again to this question about understanding our mutual dependency relationships and how do we make it acceptable and not competitively disadvantageous to people to join us in this effort. So uh, this is a challenge. I'm going to go here, there, and back. Could I ask? Could I just ask sure, a, a follow-on question? I'm curious whether wholesalers know more than the FDA about the causes. About of causes, no. The manufacturers aren't very forthcoming with us either. As well, no. This is uh, <clears throat> sorry, Ken Cliffer from uh, Asper. Uh, this is uh, sort of a question about a potential uh, shift in in. Uh, thought framework, strategic thinking. So people have pointed out that the just-in-time delivery um, model makes very little room for leeway in the system. And we've had a strategic national stockpile which is designed for disasters, but, uh, and, and has sometimes, I think, been used for other kinds of things short of disaster, what we've been calling disasters. But the question is whether perhaps uh, as I think was alluded to in one of the talks, there's like a strategic petroleum reserve that if something happens and you end up with a shortage, you have a place to go. Um, maybe the idea of shifting the concept of a strategic national stockpile for disasters could go toward, could, could be shifted towards something like uh, developing a strategic national reserve of critical medical products that involves thinking along the lines both of considering what the shelf lives are and the fact that there are sometimes incentives or, uh, for short shelf lives or disincentives towards lengthening shelf lives and that could also allow uh, figures into how much of a reserve you can have of things. Uh, that sort of way of thinking and whether that could help buffer the shortages that occur um, insofar either as they could be anticipated or just be of concern because of the criticality of the supplies. Mm -hmm. Any comment? Well, well, so I can, I can just, I'll just start. Uh, uh, it, it, it's a, a topic that comes up pretty regularly, um, and, and it's worth exploring. I mean, I think it's something that to, to, to look at. Uh, part of the challenge with stockpiles in this setting would be the, the, the control. Who would make the decisions? Um, how to how to manage the distribution? Um, many of these are very short shelf life drugs, so there'd be a, a, a challenge in bringing them into a centralized location and then distributing them back out in a timely fashion. Um, many of the shortages are also episodic; that is, they come and go. They're not they're not long term. There are long term shortages also. Um, making th those would also be challenging as far as administering a stockpile of a kind. So there are some differences between the ideas people have around stockpiling these products and the model that we use for stockpiling the, in the strategic national stockpile, which I'm, 
I'm quite familiar with because I, I, I actually managed that group for us also, um, that, that we just have to work through as we thought about it as a potential model? Might the um, VA hospital system provide a way of ge geographic distribution of shortage of shortage products? They have a they have a capacity, but they're meeting a primary mission. The question is, can they be somehow enhanced to be a reserve, if you will? Similar sort of question of funding. Vendor managed inventory is another approach to that. Whole vendor process. managed has been the way that we've obviously yeah. worked closely so, in strategic national talk about. That'd be, that would exactly be the kind of thing you'd, right. you'd, you'd want to look at. Yeah. Just, just, just a, a real quick follow up. Uh, this, this wouldn't have to be a stockpile per se. I mean, a lot of concepts have been uh, put out about uh, managed inventories, bubbles of supplies, that kind of thing. So there's a lot of different ways that this could be done. But unless we start shifting our ideas to allow for that, as against the just-in-time for everything, um, it, it's not going to happen. There's a, there's a warm-based approach to supporting a manufacturing capacity fit into this concept of a reserve, for example, is another way to be thinking about it. So there are a variety of permutations that could be explored there. Let's go here. And, and I, I just add that you can do that, um, but there's always just going to be a cost. And how much do you want to spend and how much infrastructure do you want to build? Uh, you can sort of do anything, but is that going to come from taxes? Where is it, is it going to come from fees on manufacturers? Drug prices are already way too high from my perspective, so will they raise those? All goes back to economics. You can certainly do a stockpile. How much do you want to spend to do it? Right. And the expiration is a huge yeah, problem. Yeah, I mean, we invested hundreds of millions in BARDA in human drugs, but it's rare to see more than five million invested in the development of an animal-based product, for example, because we give priority to humans. So you have all those policy decisions to make about priority and who's the winner, so to speak. There's potentially a larger cascading effect in the animal health space because it affects food supply. All right. So here, we've been promising you. Sure, uh, thanks. Uh, Laura Wolf from HHS Asper. Um, a question for you about international, um, the international community and shortages. We all know that multiple companies, uh, countries track drug shortages, medical product shortages, but in my observation, the shortages are often in very different products. Um, are, do you have any observations from either those who have facilities overseas or those who may observe other, other trends, why that might be, what uh, other countries may be doing differently, what impediments might be unique to the U.S. versus other countries for preventing uh, drug shortages? That's a good question. I think we can probably learn a fair bit from <laughs> what the U.K. is going to be doing within the next year uh, on how to handle Brexit. And uh, it's not cheap. Uh, I think I saw a news item yesterday that Pfizer alone said they were spending $100 million uh, to avoid problems with breakfast. Brexit, and uh, I think there was a similar number for Sandoz. So it's, it's um, but there's probably a lot to learn from that experience. Well, it's a great question, and I, I, I wish I'd say I knew all of as much as I'd like, to, I'd like to know about it too. We do have people that are working with the international groups trying to understand better. One thing we do know is some of the, there are governmental relationships with manufacturing that, that may be different than exist here then may bind you know, certain firms to certain amounts of manufacturing and things like that in, in, in ways that we don't see. Um, uh, but exactly why we see the range of shortages we do, and, and honestly in other parts of the world, at least in, in many other parts of the world, they don't, they don't see the same um, uh, extent of shortages, something I'd like to understand a whole lot better than I do. I, I, I don't know a lot about international shortages, but as I mentioned earlier, there, I, I'm very thankful for the FDA when I speak to my peers in different parts of the world because the integrity of our supply chain, for the most part, I mean, you have some issues with uh, you know, insulin way back out of China and all that, but for the most part, you guys inspect it and it's high quality. They don't have that uh, same level of uh, trust in generic companies in, in various countries, so um, I'm sure that impacts things because they can't buy from certain manufacturers. They don't have the data to know the quality like we do. And just a, since Ernie mentioned the UK, um, I was one of the lucky people stranded over there when the Icelandic volcano erupted. 
And one of the things that was mentioned on the news, if the uh, airspace hadn't opened when it did, the pharmacies in the UK would have all run out of product as well. So I, th I think it is somewhat of a universal problem in terms of global supply. Um, I don't know if there is a, a particular country that's, that's better at it because I, I think it's still the same economics that uh, if the manufacturer can get away with having one supplier. Um, I used to work for a pharmaceutical company and uh, we had a, a supplier in Japan, their, their building blew up. You know, that's always the standard disaster and everybody says, ah, buildings don't blow up. Yeah, this one blew up. So we had to figure out, well, what was it they sent us? What products do we use it in? And then make a decision, well, do we put that into the most profitable product or the one that saves the most lives? Because we now have a limited supply and, oh, by the way, we're gonna run out because there was only one global supplier for that cellulosic coating material. So I, I, I think it's a, a universal problem. And just to add, so recently with the Losartan, a, a hypertension medication, while there were multiple manufacturers, it appears, I'm not an absolute expert on this, that one manufacturer uh, made the, the raw ingredient and one of the excipients they found to be a carcinogen. It's not usually good to have your high blood pressure medication cause cancer, but that was, you know, although there were multiple manufacturers, there's only one source of the raw ingredient. Doug, maybe FDA. Uh, maybe. Ernie's got a grad student that would be interested in researching this area, and FDA can provide a little funding to support that. So you could answer that question. Anyway, uh, gratuitous. Let me add that I think the complication that was just noted is really a very serious one because what's happened, uh, along with most other industries in, in the U.S., uh, there's been more and more outsourcing in pharmaceuticals so that it's, uh, we have a lot of contract manufacturing organizations that manufacture API, or in some cases, a final dosage form. Uh, and so you could have uh, four companies selling a Valsartan, and yet probably have only one manufacturer of it. And, uh, we, and uh, what I've talked to some hospital pharmacists, they would love to know, particularly for some of their chemotherapies and things, who is the manufacturer? and where is it located, but the hospital uh, f for the drugs that it's buying. And the hospital doesn't even know because they would like to know that if there's a Form 483 that's been sent out, is that the manufacturer of their product? Uh, do they start uh, patients in a clinical trial or they're not sure that they'll have the, the, uh, the chemotherapy there later on when it's needed in a regimen? Um, and uh, so it's, it's uh, I can't, underemphasize, I think, the importance of trying to get a hold of data and perhaps mandating it, that we really know where things are manufactured. Absolutely. Absolutely. 100% agree with you. Well, that's, a, that's probably a legislative as opposed to a regulatory fix, wouldn't you think, Doug? There, I mean, there are a lot of pieces that we, that we don't know. Uh, right. You know, we don't know what products are being manufactured on a regular basis, for instance. I mean, manufacturers aren't required to tell us what lines are producing what products. So we know what a firm is approved to manufacture. We, we don't know what they're manufacturing. And, and, and there's, no, there's no obligation for them to tell us that except as, a, as an, an annual report, sort of late after, after the fact sort of thing. And you know, that kind of thing does make it harder for us to respond when a shortage occurs because we can't know what's out there with the warm base. We don't know what, what's actually up and ready to manufacture, or, I don't know, Losartan, um, be, because we only can look and see what, pro, what factories have been approved to manufacture it. Um, and and cool. while it's, I'm sorry, while, you know, while obviously it's political, the manufacturers don't want to disclose that, it's pr pr proprietary, that really does seem to be, I mean, not easy from a regulatory pr or political perspective, but one of the easiest things that would, would help us the most mm -hmm. is we could know, and that would help in all these disasters, you have an earthquake here, you have a tornado there. It's like, oh, they manufacture that mm -hmm. there and to give us a heads up. So, I mean, you know, hopefully that will come out in this workshop. I, I will say, back to Laura's point, that we have done a good job of building international, better infra international links there. I think we've got better information now about external U.S. manufacturing than we, we did pre you know, previously, and that gives us at least another window to look into to, to find other uh, manufacturers if we need to. 
So the challenge here is how do we expand a common operating picture and situational awareness in a market that is really predicated on competitive market forces? There seem to be somewhat in challenge there, tension between those two expectations. But I think we need to move over here. Garrett Bacher, I'm the, with the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials. Question for Mr. Callahan. Your, your last slide referenced uh, challenges with access and coordination and your reliance on local sheriffs in an emergency. Are there opportunities there to work more closely with public health and emerging, emergency management agencies uh, ahead of an event in, in planning and, and exercising and drilling to improve your access in an emergency? So I, I think Nicolette will attest to this. Um, we've been trying that for 20 years now or so. Um, it really hasn't changed that much because uh, even post, post Harvey, when they wanted to spray for mosquitoes, one justice of the peace said, not in my area, so they couldn't do it. So the local jurisdiction has a lot of control and authority, which they should. The other challenge for us is you don't see a truck driving down the road with a big Amerisource Bergen logo on the side. We use third party logistics. So even if we had a credential that said, let Amerisource Bergen through, they may be with TXX or Hackbarth or you know, one of those suppliers, now they don't match. So there are certain jurisdictions that have credentialing, you know, state of North Carolina, things like that, that we do participate in, but it's a patchwork of rules and regulations. Um, some places don't have it at all. So, you know, it is something that on a national level we have been advocating for, for a very long time. Um, I don't know that there is a one solution for that, but... Um, no, I think it would be more, more local or state solutions. Um, you, you mentioned a solution in North Carolina. It'll probably take that sort of activity at each state level. Yep, yeah. yeah. and we, we have engaged for each of the states that have a program. We are directly engaged with them. But again, it still comes down to, doesn't matter what kind of credential you have in your pocket, if that deputy sheriff doesn't want to let you through, you're not getting through. Yeah, Garen, I would, I would say, you know, if you all wanted to provide some leadership in engaging with people like Amerisource Bergen and working through your membership to sort of see if you could get a more consensus-based approach to that, it'd be helpful, my thought. Let's go over here. Amy Kircher, I'm with the University of Minnesota. Um, a comment and then a question, and the comment goes back to, um, we're talking a lot about drug shortages and the actual final product, and so one question, our comment I have is how do we get back to raw materials? What does it take to make a saline bag? What does it take to make a syringe? So not just the actual raw materials for the drug, but also for those delivery mechanisms. And then how can we get back to mapping those and finding the predictable surprises in those shortages such that we better understand that we can't even manufacture a product because we don't have the raw materials? Um, the question is regarding more specifically disasters and international disasters where we're gonna have multiple issues across the globe. And so I guess a larger question is who referees? Where do drugs go? How do we get the right thing to the right place at the right time? You know, what's WHO's role given their new operational mission? Um, so lots of questions about how do we even start to do a global footprint of how we're going to share and deliver, knowing we have our U.S. aspects, but we also know that many of our manufacturers are overseas. You may want to respond to the first part of that. I'll just uh, I'd reiterate what you said. I mean, the, the raw materials, so a lot of times our, our main campus has, you know, very good facilities for sterile products and um, we can get raw materials, but with Puerto Rico, uh, who'd have thought the plastic bags uh, were made uh, in Puerto Rico? So our usual go-to would be, can we, because sodium chloride, that's not hard to get. We can get sodium chloride, but we didn't have anything to put it in, so your, your point's well taken. I don't know that I have anything to add to that, but to agree with you. It's just back to the general point that predicting shortages is really challenging. Uh, I mean, it, it's, just, it's just simply hard to do. It, it, it starts with information, though, so it goes back to, I think, what several of us talked about. Um, whether it's 
raw materials or its container closure system or its finished products, um, the more information you have, the better you're likely going to be to predict a possible supply interruption. And, and you know, they're just pieces of information that I think we'd all like to have in, in ways that we don't, currently, we don't currently have. So understanding better how fill finish for, uh, materials were essential for normal saline might have helped us you know, predict a possible interruption um, when, when the hurricane hit. Underst we could have understood, I think, in better ways that that was going to be a real problem when, it, when we faced it. Um, th those are just the kinds of things that start with a fuller understanding of the, the sort of whole ecosystem around manufacturing. It's not, not just API. It's not just the, 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 the raw materials. It's, it's, it's everything. And uh, you know, I, back to what I said before, I, just th I think the more information we could be sharing, the more useful that could be. Yeah, to go to your last concern, and that is international coordination, that's, <clears throat> that is something that's in flux. We had a very effective mechanism through the mid-2000s called the Global Health Security Action Group, and we met with the G7 and WHO and EU uh, at various levels from staff discussions of bio threats, et cetera, all the way up to the ministerial level with just that purpose in mind of having a common understanding of where we would go in certain events. So, in, for instance, in December of 2008, the ministerial declaration was that they would not quarantine their airports in a pandemic because the public health impact of quarantining was worse than if you let the, the planes go. And we had a consensus approach to that. That same principle and opportunity process needs to be worked again. And you're right, WHO in the last year has shown a lot more vitality than they did through the mid, late 2000s, and that's a good thing. So let's go over here and then back to Monique. Hi, Nate Petey from Orbital RX. I wanted to thank everybody for being here today. This is really great to see this much attention on the subject. Um, most of the data I've seen so far over the past few years to kind of provide some awareness around the current situation with medication shortages has really focused on incidents data, which I think does a tremendous disservice to describing the current situation in the U.S. And I'm curious if there's any efforts underway to really try to bring more scope and scale uh, detailed to those metrics. When I look at the bar chart from the FDA in terms of the current incidents over the past 10 years, you would assume that, you know, it's almost never been better over the past 10 years, but I can assure you that's not our current situation. So I'm curious if we have any efforts underway to provide some prioritization, um, how many patients are impacted by this, what's the patient um, safety impact, what's the financial impact, what's the hospital operational impact. Anything that can help us, you know, better communicate that situational awareness that I think is really important, especially in an emergency response, how to position resources to respond. I, I can, uh, two, two general comments. First, I, I, uh, you're right. The bar graph that I shows focuses on just numbers of shortages. Doesn't capture at least a couple of important dimensions about drug shortages. That, that, that's my focus. Doesn't uh, capture duration. So, so, you know, are chronic shortages fundamentally different than other, a shortage that lasts, you know, shorter periods of time? Uh, normal saline is the great example. It's been it's been in and out of shortage now for several years. You know, it's a different kind of shortage maybe than a shortage that lasts a very short period of time. Second is you're asking a question about, um, let's say, let's call it high impact shortage. I don't, I don't, I don't like to, all, in, all shortages are, are high impact. All shortages are important, but some of them are, a, are, is are, a really important are just beyond, you know, think of the, think of the, the, uh, the, the vitamins and the, the parenteral, uh, you know, the, the, the zinc that w was in shortage of things or chemotherapy or something for childhood leukemia. Those are, th those are sort of a special kind of a category. And the, que you know, the question I think you're rightly asking, how do, you, how do you look at those and do you look at them any differently than you look at, at the, the, the unwashed, the other, the rest of the kinds of shortages? Um, we've not looked at them differently. That is, we've started, the FDA starts with medical necessity. So they are essential for public health in some way, shape, or form. We treat all medically necessary shortages the same. We recognize, however, that, you know, there are some of these that are just sort of above and beyond. Um, and, and, you know, 
you asked a question about tracking and measuring and things. Now I'll leave that to other people to comment about. For us, you know, there, 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 are, there are shortages that we, we need to do just everything that we possibly can and more to try to, try to address. Um, with regards to the duration, the, the chronic shortages, that, that is one of the things that we've looked at pretty closely here recently. I asked my group, do we need new tools? Do they fundamentally represent a different kind of shortage than the, the, the shortage that occurs because an API manufacturer's plant blows up and it's gonna be back in three months and you kind of know or there are three other sources or whatever. So we went back and looked at, at, at shortages that lasted more than a few months and I don't remember the cutoff exactly, but they identified a way of looking at shortages that were what they considered chronic. And then they looked at, at, at what caused them, you know, their natural history, what happened to them over time, what was it that was making them hard to resolve? Why didn't, why didn't normal saline, you know, why pick, we're picking on normal saline, why is it that normal saline bumps in and out of shortage? Um, at the end of the day, we concluded they were in shortage for the same reasons that the other products that were in shortage for, short, for shorter periods of time went into shortage and stayed in shortage. And so we, we concluded we didn't, there weren't new things we needed to try to do to those products, but we, we thought it was really important to look at that, because I, I, I agree with your comment that those two categories, those are two different ways of looking at shortages, and, and we need to make sure we're doing everything we possibly can to address them in, in, in those ways as well. I'll, I'll say volume really needs to be more represented in terms of how many doses are impacted potentially through a shortage. Um, obviously, our response will be much different for a product like saline versus any other limited use product that's on shortage. I think day two is about coming up with solutions or potential solutions. So hopefully some other uh, panelists will have some ideas around that. Right. <laughs> I'll come to you in a minute, Monique. I mean, we've been talking about drugs here predominantly. As we go through the day, we will talk about things other than drugs as well, but the principles apply the same here. Monique. Thank you, Admiral Landwagen. I'm uh, Monique Mansura, currently with the MITRE Corporation, formerly a privileged member of Admiral Landwagen's team at Asper and student of Professor Burns at MIT. Um, a hopeful sort of insight, uh, there's a program called ASIAS in the context of aviation safety. Uh, it's the Aviation Safety Information and Analysis, uh, Information uh, Analysis and Sharing. Um, and it's an it's a ecosystem of folks in the airline space, highly competitive, a lot of proprietary information, but information is provided to a safe harbor place, in this case, MITRE and FFRDC. Um, that collects, protects, analyzes the data, provides uh, benchmarks back to the community, um, but proprietary information is protected. So I think it's uh, a valid sort of system to take a look at. It seems like it has many of the similarities of what we're talking about here today. Um, uh, in the interest of sort of predict and prevent, I wonder sort of what constitutes a disaster and are we considering the escalating uh, trade uh, tariffs and trade wars and the list of pharmaceutical or medical supply products that are on that list and how they might um, be indicative of future concerns, uh, so how that's being considered by the various organizations. And then the, one of the levers that um, Dr. Yaskowski mentioned this morning was CMS. So when you think of what are the influences that at least on the public sector side there's control or influence the reimbursement rates that CMS provides for things like IV saline, and how do we see, if we look at a system level, how those decisions are determining sort of the number of suppliers and the capacity in the system? Uh, two things. Uh, somebody else may want to reply to you, but one, thank you for that specific example. I think that will be part of the proceedings that we'll push forward. Here's an example of how you might approach this business of more data transparency while protecting the business concerns that people have. Uh, as to the geopolitical realities, clearly geopolitics play in disasters, yes, and they're disastrous potentially in terms of their impact on supply chain. So uh, geopolitics clearly 
I mean, I was doing a lot of business in Turkey, for instance, until the last year, year and a half, because the politics internally became much more difficult. So business and policymakers have to take into account those geopolitical realities as they think about how do I plan for how this disaster may affect that disaster should this become a disaster. I think you're right about that, Monique. Well, we've, uh, we have one more person and then it's uh, break time. Hi, I'm Brenda Shafi from GlaxoSmithKline. I thought I might share an industry per um, perspective from a drug manufacturer based on some of the comments that were made earlier today. Um, just for clarification, manufacturers are required to inform the agency what is giving rise to the footage. The FDA website will actually advise you that to do that. So there's not a mechanism to avoid it. What is different, though, is the level of detail that might be hmm. provided around that general criteria. For example, is it a um, current good manufacturing practice concern. Um, for example, GSK, we take our compliance with NDA um, details as well as CGMPs very seriously. So sometimes we halt supply because there's been an incident at the manufacturing site. Um, but we, uh, and in GSK's practice, we would give some level of detail to the drug shortage team about what has transpired in that case. Um, I would encourage anyone who works in industry to please um, work with the drug shortage team as soon as possible. It, there's, they're a great group to work with. Um, we found in many cases that we've been able to collaborate with the drug shortage team to mitigate uh, potential impact on patients. So um, they do great work and it's a very, so when people, industry gets nervous sometimes about inter interacting with the FDA, not this team. Please just let them know as much as you can as soon as you can. Um, mm -hmm. um, secondly, um, related to international um, interactions. So a lot of the pharma companies, most these days are global suppliers. So oftentimes we do have manufacturers that are approved in European markets. Um, given with the current mutual recognition between European inspections and FDA inspections, um, it would seem that if we had sites approved in Europe or perhaps not for the US supply stream, that would be a mechanism to bring more drugs into the US. So in cases of trying to map out potentially critical products, I would encourage FDA, when you realize there's a shortage, not just reach out to the manufacturers that actually make that product, but perhaps other manufacturers, because they may not have that product supplied, I mean, approved for U.S. supply. Um, so, you know, the global manufacturing network that the pharma company might be aware of could actually provide some additional information to the drug shortage teams that they would know to chase other leads in Europe. Um, and again, about the supply chain. all the critical products coming into the U.S. I think the industry concern would be making it publicly available. However, I think industry would be very willing and inclined to work with agencies to supply chain products. I don't think that you get a lot of support from industry to make that publicly available. That's it. Actually be a security threat if somebody wanted to intentionally disrupt the supply chain if everybody knew exactly where everything was manufactured. So. Well, I think that's a, a very fine note to have you step forward and speak uh, from your industry experience and advocate engagement, again, and advocating engagement that finds solutions that we all can work and live with. And I, I was glad to, I'm glad to have this session end on that particular note coming from one of our industry participants. And thanks to our panelists, it's been a great discussion. They did a great job, I think, in uh, helping us to get to common terms. And let's send them off with applause and go to break. And you've got about 30 minutes. <laughs>